Hello folks, this is a um, lecture on environmental systems. Uh, I'm going to look at uh, biomass production and its implications. Um, so what is biomass? Well, it's, it's very often some people think of biomass as the mass of um, biological material because very often you do measure the mass of the material. But it, we're, the, the mass in this sense is really the material itself for, uh, that is derived um, from organisms. Um, so it's the, the actual tissue of animals and plants. Uh, the tissue is produced through nutrition, growth and development. And ultimately this comes from the sunlight. And of course that will vary um, throughout the year and also from year to year. And I suppose in one way biomass is something that you know you, you can measure in, in many different ways. Um, like when you, when you count tree rings you're looking at a very kind of uh, rough uh, version of um, a biomass measurement where the thickness of the ring um, gives an indication of the, the biomass production for that year. And, and that can lead to a lot of other uh, inferences that can be made about the environmental um, parameters that were different for a particular year. Um, plant biomass is, is, is really the sort that I'm more interested in. Mainly because it's, uh, uh, I, I, that's my own particular, uh, as it were, speciality is in is in botany, um, and it's easier to to do work like that with uh, with students because when we start looking at animal biomass, measuring that involves collecting lots of animals in in the sample area and, and killing them. Okay, so ethically that's difficult. Um, plant biomass is mainly the plant cell wall material, which is chiefly cellulose. But you could also, you know, there's lignin and other complex carbohydrates as well that that would be um, that would be produced in a year. And I've just mentioned animal biomass. Um, plant biomass. Well, it's as you can see, 44% is, is proper cellulose, which is derived as a polymer of glucose. Um, you've also got uh, the blue thing is a hemicellulose, which is um, produced. Um, as a polymer of xylose, it's a different sugar. So you can see between uh, cellulose and hemicellulose is a huge quantity, and then ling lignin, okay, which is um, and again an even further um, complex um, polymer of, uh, of of cellulose. So what's the importance? Why why do we um, bother thinking about this? Well, because uh, Given that we, we live on the green planet and given that we are the distance that we are from the sun and the nutrients that are available on the planet, it is the optimum uh, distance from the sun for the production of biomass. Biomass forms the foodstuff, of course, for not just ourselves. Um, it's, uh, you know, we derive biomass, plant biomass, we would um, consume in the form of cereal, fruit, and vegetables and and these are produced in that they're not you know constantly available all all year round and always in the same place and that these these vary so we need to know um, we need to know uh, you know how to have a continuous supply of these sort of stuffs okay otherwise we we have to go through experience famines but it's not just uh, humans, but also uh, domestic animals, and of course all wild animals in in ecosystems, not directly uh, influenced by humans. Uh, domestic animals are going to uh, consume biomass, um, either as fresh grass, dried grass, which, which of course hay, fermented grass, which is silage, and then other cereal stems, which will take the form of straw. Um, it also forms bedding, of course, hay and straw form bedding, but uh, they're also consumed as well. Um, the composition, of course, of grassland, which gives rise to uh, the biomass for foodstuff for domestic animals, um, the composition of the grassland is critical, um, and as well as, uh, say, we're looking at bovine animals, of course, uh, they give rise to a whole lot of secondary products, such as dairy, you know, milk, uh, cheese, yogurt, and so on. So, and the flavor of the milk and the nutrient, you know, composition of the milk will be influenced by the herbage that is uh, that is in the in the actual uh, 
pasture itself. Um, plant biomass is also an important source for eth ethanol production um, and biomass is also critical for nutrient recycling for example carbon and nitrogen and you know, so you you find sometimes that uh, farmers would plant fields of of corn but the corn is not for consumption by humans uh, it is actually um, a green fertilizer um, it's recycling nitrogen to put back into the into the soil and as well as that having a field of um, having a field of uh, say corn um, has an impact on the carbon uh, available in the atmosphere okay very small effect but you know over thousands of acres uh, collectively it would actually um, um, make a small difference so one of the, the key things about biomass is actually assessing uh, you know because I mentioned the changes that take place over the, over a year um, and that relates of course to things like crop productivity uh, knowing what you know when are the optimum times for harvest um, monitoring your biomass production uh, this is very often what uh, farmers will do uh, that they will uh, wish to monitor you know how how their production you know towards harvest is doing and um, you know there's uh, different so uh, quantitative biomass measurement is where we um, take a sample of grassland that's typically 25 by 25 centimeters uh, we take all of the plant material above ground and we weigh it we dry it in an oven and then we weigh it again um, and then of course there's a combined uh, method where we will actually measure the biomass okay uh, but we'll separate it by species composition uh, we can also do above and below ground and we can combine that also then with soil analysis so uh, the technique that uh, that we typically then follow is we select a series of sample sites and in, in what we did was is we were selecting sites close or under tree canopies and so the objective of the study might be to examine ground mass biomass production at the woodland grassland interface uh, which is obviously an interesting um, it's a, I suppose it's an ecosystem in itself and there are species of wildflowers which uh, specifically are adapted to, to that woodland grassland interface um, if we think of um, buttercups for example or the members of the ranunculaceae family uh, meadow buttercup and creeping buttercup are, are open uh, open, I would say open air, non woodland plants, and then lesser celandine is um, a deciduous woodland member of the family, and then um, Goldilocks then will be a plant that's specifically adapted to the woodland grassland interface. Um, as you okay, as you go out into the open, um, if the grassland is is not. Uh, is a mixed grassland maybe a wet grassland you know creeping buttercup uh, and some meadow buttercup will be uh, dominate but when we get into dry grassland uh, then you get um, the meadow buttercup will be the, the most significant so you can actually just in one mem one family we can look at four different members of that family it's lesser celandine it's goldilocks it's creeping buttercup and meadow buttercup and those four will will dominate uh, at different times in the year but also in location depending on the availability of light which is the key thing and also competition from other uh, grasses so we remove all the plant material within 25 by 25 squares within the sample sites and we weigh the material we place in the oven 80 degrees for three to four days and then we weigh it again and we can repeat that depending on So I'm just cutting off the, all of the uh, green material, organic material, leaf litter. Yeah. Surface in a 25 by 25 uh, quadrant. So this is just to work out plant biomass. So I try not to collect any wood lice I come across. Way lads. 
cut it right down to the roots. There's a, you can see a real mix of dried material uh, as well as the, the nice green stuff. Mm -hmm. you take all, it's all the biomass, you know, as much as possible. Even the stick, you take the bit that sticks into the, into the coin wrap. Dry grass really is dried in. These things that keep dropping, they're the, the leaf covers for the lime trees. Mm. We have to include them. Okay. Dusty stuff there, and I'm not going to pull that out. It. So, so that's our that's our surface biomass. So then what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to take um, this is not as a we don't have to fill the whole thing. We just have to uh, get it core. Because I can tell you now we're not going to because of the stones and everything in here. Like look at the size of this thing. You know? uh, interestingly, it's a piece of oyster shell. So you can, you can work out why you think that's here. <laughs> A centimetre and a half. Two centimetres. Stone. Just to mark the level of the ground, how deep we've gone. Four and a half centimeters. Okay, and that's our core. It's not, it's not great. That's because of the stones on the ground. And that's our core. And that's it. That's how we're going to measure the the total uh, the total plant biomass. Okay, because we're only interested in the roots. Rather than the okay. Okay. Location. So uh, there's himself measuring the sample area and removing the above ground biomass. And you take down all of the uh, the root material and the dead plant material that is above ground until you've got bare soil. Okay. Uh, the other thing I think we did as well is is that we took a core of about four centimeters 
using um, using a can, and uh, we that's taken as a subsample. And of course, you you measure your volume of soil because it's um, pi r squared h is the formula used, and uh, you can then separate out if you want the below ground biomass roots and so on uh, from the soil. Uh, usually, that's done by washing. Uh, you place the material in the sieve and you wash the soil through, and and then you repeat. You dry, you dry the, the the biomass below ground biomass and you measure and so on. Um, so your results um, uh, will be uh, weights, and uh, you can compare with other locations as we did, uh, as opposed to times of the year. If you're monitoring uh, your ecosystem, it's more it's more times of the year at different locations that you're going to be doing. Uh, typical results then. Um, so here's a, here's a three sample sites and they're completely different. So they are. And what you see, for, you know, I start with them. For me, the more, most interesting one is the is the gray one, which is sample site three. And it is diminishing from May all the way through to September. Uh, so what we have here is then uh, is uh, we have a sample site where the, and this is sort of ground uh, herbage, and the ground herbage seems to have come from a peak uh, at May, and is uh, the the biomass available above ground is continuing diminishing all the way through uh, through the summer. So this is uh, uh, this strikes me that this is um, a habitat. Where the maximum amount of material it has it has been produced, in particular, and I'm thinking of say a, a woodland where there is um, say a lot of um, um, members of the onion family, bulbs like daffodils and bluebells and and so on. And once the the, the, the leaves come on the trees, the you start losing um, uh, you start losing your 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 light. And the nutrients uh, diminish, uh, and that's why you have a loss of biomass to a minimum around uh, September. Um, the blue, you can see then the whole thing, it peaks uh, in August at some stage. okay, And that would be typical of, say, an uh, open uh, grassland going for hay production, um, where you, you, you have... And you can even think of it in terms of the height of plants. So they go from, say, seedlings towards the the mid to um, early May, and they're you know can be up to half a meter, if not more, depending on whatever crop it is. Um, by the time August comes, and then they're harvested, and then they fall off very quickly uh, in August, depending on the uh, because even if you leave it standing. Then you have a crop uh, deteriorating, uh, and uh, and then we have uh, sample site two. It's um, is interesting because we have um, a downward from May to June, and then upward from June to July. And uh, what we what this would indicate to me is um, different species are are successively uh, becoming dominant one after the other, and this is the concept of succession in ecology. Um, now a graph, if you do um, just an overall uh, total biomass, it doesn't tell you anything about composition. So it, in the sample site too, what you would need to do is, is you'd need to do a separate biomass measurement for each species. And that would give you a much more interesting picture. Okay, so this is um, just to uh, sum up then. The, um, the key thing here um, is that biomass is basically is where mo I'd say most of our food comes from, either at primarily in the form of um, cereals, fruit, fruit and veg, and but also secondarily, actually through meat and to dairy. Um, it's the main uh, food stuff then, obviously for domestic animals, okay, uh, but it also is the a huge food stuff also for the uh, primary consumers in. In most ecosystems, okay. So we've got um, much of the uh, the heterotroph um, uh, nutrition is going to come from plant biomass, okay. 
uh, humans also have gone on and then deliberately use uh, plant biomass for, say, something like ethanol production for as a, as a fuel, but also then to um, to do some kind of atmospheric um, uh, manipulation for carbon uh, carbon cleaning, we could say, or nitrogen fixation. Uh, and the key thing, I suppose, with biomass is is that uh, it's uh, it's we can. The emphasis that I'm bringing up here is that it is used um, as a form of monitoring. So we can monitor grasslands by a qualitative and quantitative biomass production. Okay, so thanks very much.